Did you catch that? The International Space Station just flew across my face. Or rather, it transited across my face. It went past so fast that it was only there for half a second. Of all the photos I've taken, my most popular image is of the space station in silhouette, transiting across a colour photo of the moon. Yeah, isn't that a great picture? That, awesome. that guy in Australia? Yeah. I'm going to see him uh, next month. Yeah, I've given up. Oh, that's a hard picture. Yeah. Yeah. But it's brilliant. And it's just a guy. But how are you supposed to photograph something going 7.5 kilometres per second and capture it sharp and still? What equipment do you need to do this yourself? And why do flat earthers think I work for NASA? Creating elaborately faked images to convince people that space exists. <laughs> well, get your cameras ready, flat earthers. I'm going to show you how to catch the space station for yourself. So you can dig your personal hole of cognitive dissonance even deeper than it already is. My name is Dylan O'Donnell, and you're watching Star Stuff. There are lots of sites and apps available to track the International Space Station, but the one I recommend is calsky.com. I like it so much that even though it's free, I donated to its developer, because it provides a massive level of detail and access to so many different phenomena, including iridium flares, occultations, and all kinds of other stuff. It also provides useful maps and planning information too. The user interface is a little dated and quirky, but it doesn't matter. Sign up for free and add your GPS coordinates into the setup. Then set your email alerts for things you'd like to be notified about, like space station transits. Also, when you're logged in, if you explore the various targets, it will tell you about nearby opportunities, in case you want to travel to see one. But if you're like me, you're pretty lazy and you just want to wait till one happens right where you are, so you don't have to move. I'm not sure this strategy will work for everyone, though. I know some people who have been waiting years for a transit, um, but I seem to get you know, one or two every single year. For planning, I like to use SkyGuide to simulate the transit ahead of time so I can visualise the direction and the angle it hits the moon. This will make your framing of the event much easier to plan. The path in the app isn't as accurate as CalSky though, so use it as a rough guide, but not gospel. CalSky knows what it's doing. The sun and the moon are pretty big, so most telescopes, even modest ones, are going to be able to photograph them and the ISS together. If you can see craters on the moon in good detail, you're going to be able to photograph the space station. A CCD is not going to work for this, it's too slow. You want a DSLR or a high-speed CMOS planetary camera capable of freezing the space station in time. As a rule of thumb, this means at least 1 1600th of a second is the shutter speed on your DSLR which equals 0.625 milliseconds. As long as your camera is set to a speed at that or faster, you'll capture it without motion blur. The other thing to consider is how fast the camera can burst a series of frames during the transit, which will happen very quickly. About three seconds, and you'll see there that it's starting to buffer those shots down. So now I've only got five, if I started shooting now, I'd only have six, seven shots. If you burst too soon with the DSLR shooting raw, or your memory card is too slow, it might slow down or stop before the transit occurs as the memory bottleneck fills up. I've done this before and it's terrible. You don't have to worry much with high-speed CMOS planetary cameras, which are essentially shooting video, but remember that even though these cameras keep gathering frames, they do drop frames if your USB or hard drive isn't fast enough to write the data. It's possible to miss the ISS in a couple of frames or entirely if the camera decides to seize up during the wrong moment. If you're using a camera like this, you should consider a solid state hard drive and plenty of RAM and native USB 3 support to ensure it drops as few frames as possible. Something else to note is that while a mono black and white high speed camera will get more detail than a color DSLR, you also won't be able to get the color of the moon or the ISS in this case. The reason I was able to get color in my image was because I was using a color DSLR camera and I stacked the lunar surface and stretched the color in post using the original ISS frame as the reference. Another thing to consider is the chip size. Your high speed CMOS camera might be fast but have a very small chip and you can only get a small part of the frame. You can use a field of view calculator to work this out beforehand, though it will be pretty obvious when you go to take a photo whether you can fit the whole moon in or not. Also, if you're lucky enough to get an illuminated transit... Here it comes. I think it's gonna land on the moon, Dad. 
This means the sun is still reflecting on the space station and you'll be able to pick up the colour of its solar arrays on an image just like this one I took. That's something else to consider when you choose the right camera for the job. I've already mentioned that the shutter speeds need to be higher than 1 1600th of a second or 0 0.625 milliseconds to freeze the space station. If you zoomed in close, you want to try even faster to avoid the potential for motion blur. All your other settings need to work around that speed. Put your ISO as high as it needs to be to expose the moon and sun at this speed, but as low as you can without introducing much more noise. Now, this is important. If you're using a DSLR, do not, I repeat, do not feel tempted to switch over to video. It won't work. Frame rate and shutter speed are different things, and a frame rate's exposure is typically 1 24th, 1 30th, or 1 60th, depending on the video's auto exposure, which is way too slow. DSLRs sometimes don't tell you the shutter speed during video recording, or that you pull it down to the speeds we need without a very expensive camera, or the custom Magic Lantern firmware for Canon. You might catch the ISS in real time this way, shooting video, but it will be a streaky blur, and you may struggle to convince your friends it's the ISS at all. Some telescope setups will go out of focus as the ambient temperature changes. So choose a detail on the sun of the moon, or like a crater rim, to focus on and adjust your focus every now and then, all the way leading up to the time of the transit. Your DSLR is probably going to hibernate and turn itself off while you're waiting. Make sure it doesn't do this by taking the occasional photo in the lead up. Okay, we've got it set to high speed. I'm shooting in RAW. Also try some high speed bursts to see how long you've got before the memory slows down. But don't do this just before the transit or it will still be trying to write to the card when you're ready to burst. Now you're set up, you should log back into CalSky on your phone or computer at least 30 minutes before the transit and get an update on the time it's going to happen. CalSky is very accurate. It's constantly adjusting its predicted times based on changes to the orbit and other telemetry data of the International Space Station and you might find it even change by several seconds on the day. The time you get 30 minutes before the transit should be very accurate though. These days your phone's time is synced to a cell tower, so it's usually accurate down to the millisecond, but I recommend using an app on your phone that shows the time digitally in seconds or milliseconds. If you're working on a computer, make sure its time is recently synced to an NTP server, so it's also 100% accurate. Of course, make sure all the rest of your setup is good to go. The batteries are charged, you have enough memory for storage, the kids are in bed and aren't going to need your attention at any point during mummy or daddy's important work, that sort of thing. If you're using a high-speed CMOS, you can probably set the video for, say, a minute and then start recording 30 seconds before the transit time. But if you're like me and using a DSLR for the colour and the frame quality, you'll have to get ready with your finger on the shutter release preferably a remote cable one, and keep one eye on the clock. If it's an illuminated transit, it's much easier. You can see the ISS with your eye as it's going towards the sun or the moon. But if it's a solar or in shadow transit, you can't see jack You just have to trust that CalSky will be right and start bursting those frames about one or two seconds before the time of the transit. Here it comes. Watch it, watch it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> At this point, you don't really know if you got it or not without reviewing the frame. So you'll be excited, you want to start flicking back through the files on the DSLR preview. We're going frame by frame through the video file from a high speed CMOS camera. If you didn't get it, something went wrong, but if you followed all of these steps, chances are you've got a frame of the International Space Station over the moon, which is exactly how you might feel right now. Catching the ISS is like going fishing and catching the big one, or trying to catch a fly with chopsticks. If you did it, congratulations, Daniel son. It's time to process your image and share it, preferably with me via social media, and let me know if this video helped. If you want to see how I process my original space station transit photo, visit photographingspace.com. I'll put a link in the description that describes that process in full.
We shouldn't have to do this, but because some people are too stupid to believe the ISS is real, I always provide my raw, unedited frame so that space deniers can check. I also provide the Cal Sky data so it can be cross-referenced. Occasionally astrophotographers will also fake these shots and have been called to task for it before, so make sure you provide proof, just in case someone wants it. Don't worry, the space deniers will tell you that even though you aren't technically a faker, NASA is somehow projecting the image into your telescope to trick us all. And you can tell them that if they think that's true, then you know a video on YouTube that will show them how to do it themselves. And they should. But if they don't, or they won't, well, then they're just full of shit.